Okay, so tonight is going to be really wild, man. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go right, right with the open it. Which is easier to believe, the Bible or history? Anybody? Bible. What's easier to believe, Bible or history? Well, you're, of course you're going to say the Bible, right? Because we're in church right now, right? One goes hand in hand. Well, as Christians, right, historically, things happen, right? And, and they're like, especially in our country, you know, like there was, do you guys know there was a civil war in our nation? You know, if you go back to the south and around that area, you can find a bunch of battlefields and all kinds of cool stuff. And we read about that in history and we go and we look at it right there. Well, biblically, we're talking about stuff that's 3,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years old. It's not that easy to do. So God designed something here, man. And, and I know we read through stuff in the Bible and sometimes we miss stuff, all right? Well, tonight... We're gonna, I'm going to show you something. First of all, it says this is about prophecy meeting up with history. So let's just say somebody in this room was sitting in the, in the room when they signed the Declaration of Independence. We all know when that was, right? Oh, come on, man. 1776, man. Remember July 4th, fireworks, flags and stuff? Man, Lord, we were just there, man, a week ago. <sighs> I need a break, dude. Okay, anyway, so let's just say hypothetically you were there, and then you stood up in the room and said, Oi, in 246 years, what did I write? I had it really good in there. Oh, yeah, a suicide bomber will set off a bomb and kill 13 young Americans in a place called Afghanistan in a disastrous withdrawal of the United States military. And a rogue rally of ruffians from the Roadhouse Biker Church will mount 13 flags on their motorcycles and transport them from California to Arizona and on across the country. And all the guys in there would be like, what the heck is Afghanistan? What's a motorcycle? And what is a Roadhouse Biker Church? They wouldn't know. But here we are in 2020, and you know what happened? There was a disastrous withdrawal in Afghanistan. A suicide bomber did his thing and killed 13 beautiful young Americans, men and women, and then a bunch of rogue rally, what do I call it? Uh, rogue rally of ruffians. I don't know where that came from, man. <laughs> Mounted a bunch of flags, and they just crossed from Georgia to South Carolina. Yeah. Just this last weekend with a beautiful video that I think is going to be shown here pretty shortly. And they're not going to Washington. No. No. Because there's a bunch of weenies in Washington that won't let us do it. So, they're getting a permanent home in Arlington National Cemetery. Exactly where they belong, amen? Yeah. So, that would be prophecy meeting up with history. Because it would have been said, and it would have been... Now, you can look at that and go, well, Denver knew that that was said in 1776, so he just planned all this stuff so that it happened and I could, you know, make prophecy, you know, fulfilled. I would have to know from 20 years ago when we entered Afghanistan after 9-11 and all, everything jumped off, I would have to know exactly when we were going to withdraw, when a president was going to be elected that would do it, and when and where that suicide bomber was going to show up and what 13 people were going to be standing at the exact spot they needed to be to be killed by that suicide bomb. It's astronomical. It's one in about one plus zeros that go all the way to the moon. There's absolutely no way. And prophecy here in the Bible does the same exact thing, man. And the reason God did it was because there was going to be naysayers. They were going to go, eh, I don't believe all that Bible stuff. We already saw in Isaiah that Isaiah prophesied that Tyre would be flat. And I, everything would be washed in the ocean. And the only thing it would be good for is fishermen to dry their nets. And everyone's like, ah, whatever. And 3,000 years later, they didn't, they didn't know what it was, but they knew there was a big flat rock that fishermen literally laid their nets out now, today. And divers went down. And you know what they found? They found a bunch of remnants of a city called, say it with me, Tyre. They didn't even know it existed. They thought it was a myth. But it was prophesied. And this all happened you know, like in the 1700s, 1800s when that was all discovered there. So tonight we're going to see something really wild, amen, as we dive into this thing. And keep in mind, though, <clears throat> we're still working idols right now. 
from last week. So this is just a continuation of last week's story about us. Let's open a word of prayer. Father, we thank you now for your word, Lord, and all the cool stuff that you bring us in your word, Father. Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us tonight, to open our eyes and ears and our hearts for the message you have for each one of us in Jesus' name. <clears throat> okay, so, where am I starting? Isaiah 21? Okay, right here. So, last week, Dad was talking about all these idols and how stupid they are. And how foolish people are that buy them and make them out of one piece of wood and then cut the wood in half and use half for food and warmth and cut the other one into their idol and then they lay down in front of that and say, oh, I worship you, blah, blah, blah. And it went on and on and on and on. And he finally got down to the part where he said, these idols are just ashes. That's, that's what it all comes down to with idols. They'll leave you broke. You won't receive anything because they're not real. And so... We're starting in 21 now, and he says, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. See, what he's saying is, remember those idols for them. To us, he's saying, remember these idols, whatever the idols are in your life. And we discussed it all last week, not necessarily statues. And check this out, man. I got no problem with statues. I really don't, man. I think they're pretty cool. Um, there's all kinds of cool things like that cross right there. I think that's really cool, but I don't bow down and worship that cross right there, man. That just reminds me of what my Savior did for me, man. That's all that's about back there. But when people start worshiping things, whether it's money or jobs or relationships or anything, they put that before God, it becomes an idol. Drugs, alcohol, addictions, I mean, man, there's a lot of stuff that, that's tricky and, and clever that you don't even know you've begun to idolize it and put it before God. And so we, we want to examine ourselves. So God says, hey, remember these things. Think about it, man, because you're, you're my servant. You're not that fake idol servant, man. You're mine. And he goes on like this. Look, he, he makes it so much more intimate here. He goes, I formed you. You are my servant. <clears throat> Excuse me. God's telling us in that one little part there, I was here first before all these goofy idols were around. I formed you. He's going to get even more, more involved here in a second here. He goes, oh, Israel, you will not be forgotten. Okay, this is the part where a record's playing, you know, and they're like, you know, got you in a stranglehold, baby, and, and the record scratches because he goes, oh, Israel, you will not be forgotten. You will not be forgotten by me. And they're like, wait a minute. Wait, what? What do you mean we're not going to be forgotten? Oh, yeah, you're going into captivity for 70 years, by the way. But, 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 well, but what? <laughs> Talk to your idol. <laughs> this might be a good time for you to bow down, Jackson. He goes, I have blotted out the, but look what he says here. You will not be forgotten by me. <clears throat> yes, you're going to go through some stuff for 70 years, but I'm not going to forget about you. I blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me for I have redeemed you. The, the whole cloud would be very reminiscent of the wilderness. When, when the cloud and the flame, they followed it and the cloud would set at, by day over the temple and the sacrifice, they would have got what he was talking about. That's where the whole forgiveness thing was taking place with the incense and the cloud would fill the temple and his glory like a veil <clears throat> and all that cool stuff. So they would have got what he was talking about there about their sins being gone. And he goes, return to me for I have redeemed you. You're going to go down a really tough road right now because you're just stinking stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. And now you're going to be captured right now. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be really hard. I'll be with you through the whole thing, though. I will never let you be alone. I'll be with you. And then when it's over, come back to me and return to me. Which, just so you know, after the Babylonian captivity, that's exactly what they did. When they, when, well, I'll get to all that. When, when, they were sent, when they went back to Jerusalem, they, they really pulled their heads out of their hats, man. And they got it together after that for a pretty long time. But anyway... Now he's going to switch gears in here because there's a deal about worship, all right? We're called to worship God. And he's saying, if you're going to worship idols, you're not going to be worshiping me. So look what he says here. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains. O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Now hold on and check this out. What is he saying here? What's God saying to you and me? What was he saying to the, Jew, to the Israelites 3,000 years ago? If you're not going to worship me, creation will. Okay, we've heard that, we've heard that before, and I'm going to show you a verse about that in a minute here. But let's look at what he's really saying, okay? Oh heavens, sing, oh heavens, for the Lord has done it. 
So everything above us, we're talking stars, the moon, the sky, the air that we breathe and stuff like that. Let's just hypothetically say we're all kicking back here and, and all of a sudden the atmosphere, the heavens decides it wants to just say, hallelujah. And we're like, oh, <laughs> as it's worshiping all the air <laughs> up to God. I'm just saying. And look at the next one. Shout you lower parts of the earth. Has anybody, does any of you know that the, the San Andreas fault line runs about five miles from here? Like right, it runs right across just about my front yard. It's about 100, maybe 100 yards in front of my house, man. And I'm on the fish food side of California, you know, like catch a wave and you're, you know, going to drown in the big wild ocean. But anyway, what if the lower parts of the earth was a little representative to a, a fault line and, and in creation? And it's like the fault line's just all kicking back there and they're talking to other fault lines. I don't know if they do that, but they're like, hey, let's worship God. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord! And we're just like, oh, you know, going crazy here. What about the mountains? The mountains break forth into singing. What if the mountains just started bouncing around, man? I know there's a few of you that live up here in the mountains, and there's a few bunnier part. Oh, forest and every tree in it. What if the trees started doing like the locomotion, man? Everybody, and I know there's people right now that have big pine trees right next to their house, man. What would it be like to have one of those monster pine trees just roll right through your house, praising God? How stupid would we feel? If nature started worshiping God, because we just can't get ourselves to do it, man. But that's nothing new, because when Jesus came in on the uh, Palm Sunday, and they were doing Hosanna, Hosanna, and all that stuff, and, and, and all the you know, uptight ones with the beards and the goofy hats and stuff like that, they're like, hey, you told them people to shut up. And he's like, man, if I told them to shut up, the rocks would worship me. So it's already in the Bible. Don't be mistaken that you look at a big rock and you're like, hey, it's just a big dead rock. Don't think that rock can't do whatever the heck God wants that rock to do. All right? That rock could probably, just, if God said, you know what? Well, okay, let me rephrase. If I was God, I'd go, you know what? Just jump up and right back down. And that's it. You're gone, man. And then the rock goes, hallelujah. <laughs> but I'm not God, so you don't need to worry about it. For the most part, you're safe. But check out Romans 8 with me real quick. Let me show you a little bit of New Testament stuff here. Romans 8, something, 19. All right, I didn't mark it, so I'm going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. Oh, here it is. What am I doing here? 19 to something? 22. Okay, look at what it says here. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, us, the saved, the salvation. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and its glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So the end, the rapture, when God has chosen all that, that's going to be chosen that are going to receive his son, and the rapture happens... All the, after that tribulation, thousand year reign, all that stuff, everything is getting destroyed, man. Just gone. And all of creation will, will also be rebuilt, remade, along with us and our glorified bodies and stuff. And creation is eagerly waiting for it to happen. So, you know, you might be outside. You might be up on a mountain, man, just hanging out, you know, and you're kind of talking with someone. You're trying to do a little evangelism thing and stuff like that, but you're not. You're a little bit scared. You're a little bit shy. You're not really sure. And there's a big pine tree behind you going, come on, get on with it already, man. Lead that guy to the Lord. There's one more down, you know. Of course, we don't hear all that, but creation Man, God made all this stuff. We're so goofy, man. We're like, oh, a tree's an inanimate object. That's a bunch of baloney. God made that big old palm tree out there, man. God made everything. All these bricks, the wood, all this stuff. This is all God's. And we're so, we're so freaking wrapped up in us and our, our, ourselves, our knowledge, that God can't just do anything that he would want to do in this church right now. He, he might want to put the stage on the other side and flip the sound booth over here. And you know what God could do? He could do it, man. And if, he, and if he chose to tell this pulpit to just jump and, and beep, 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 right out the door, it would do it, man, because this is subject to God, too. But we look at him as just, eh, it's a piece of wood. Ah, piece of wood. Ooh, couldn't resist. Okay. Okay, let's move on. I'm sorry. That was, uh, that was a little bit. Okay, here's, here's God coming back to us now. So he's letting us know, look, if you won't worship, creation will. Just know that, all right? But he says, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. That's super important. Remember the whole kinsman Redeemer thing? 
If somebody, you know, was in some sort of a debt and a slave and stuff like that, a family member could come and purchase them out of that and be the kinsman redeemer. And they usually go marry him or something like that, you know, and hopefully it you know, <laughs> was like good. You know, somebody showed up. It wasn't like Job of the Hutt or something like, I'm going to redeem you. <laughs> You're going to be my wife. <laughs> like, oh, I think I'll stay here. Oh, it's the law. <laughs> Come on, baby. Get on my donkey. <laughs> but I'm sorry. I got a. I got wrapped up with the music tonight. Wasn't it cool, man? Crusher was just like banging the bongos, man. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer, man. He, he's our king, man, he, and, and God called him that. And he says, look, I'm your redeemer. You are paid for, but you're going through some stuff. You're going to have to go through it because let go back a few you know, sentences because you're stupid and, and you're just stuck on stupid. So you've got to get shaken up, man, so that we can get back in line. He goes, this is the Lord, your redeemer, and he who formed you from where? The womb, man. How much more intimate does it have to get for people, man, to understand that God knows every little thing about you? Absolutely, beyond a doubt, God formed you. He made you. Babies are precious. They're from God, man. He made them. I'm not going to get into a big old deal on that right there, but that's my view on it right there, amen? He made it. So that all aside... He knew you. He knew all of us from before we were, we were, and, and everything that we were going to do and where it was going to lead to and all these things, this, you know, God, God sees it all from before, after, above, below, and all that stuff. And he says, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth with myself. You can trust me, says the Lord. Everything that's going on around you, Babylon, the, the walls that are 320 feet high, you know how big that is? This, this ceiling is 10 feet tall right here. You'd have to stack 31 more of these on top of each other to be the height of the walls of Babylon, man. Two, two four, six, eight, all the way to that back door and all the way to that wall are how thick the walls were, 80 feet. They were 80 feet wide, as wide as this whole church, and 320 feet high. And he goes, everything that's around you that's formidable, that you're like looking at it, you're like, oh my God, there's no way out of this. I made it. Keep that in mind. Therefore, I control it. And everything that happens in it. If I want you there, dude, or do dead. You're going to be there, man. If I don't, here's the deal, pick. Oh, sorry. Here's the deal. Sorry. My, my bad. All right. I will rephrase if he doesn't want you there, here's the deal. You ain't going to be there. And I'm going to prove it to you tonight. Amen. So when we're going through stuff and we got all these things crashing down on us and things in front of us, everything that you see, God is in control of. He made it all. He said it right here. He made it all. And before he said he made it all, he told us that he's our redeemer. He asked us to come back and, and, and return to him. And he said over here, you will not be forgotten. So whatever you're going through right now, don't trip. Nick, is that, Matt, is that a trick? Oh, I can't use that word. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so he's got it. All right, let's just leave it at that. All right. Uh, uh, he's a freaking. Anyway, so check this out. Huh? <laughs> yeah. It's like I have, a, I have like a, an emergency break in my brain, and for the most part, it works. <laughs> Some, when, like for really important stuff, yeah, it's like a safety valve, and I'm like, and it, goes, and it like jerks my vocal cords back, and then I can't say things that I would normally say. Right? And you know what else helps with that? That stinking camera right there, man. I've gotten away with a lot of stuff before that thinking camera was up there, man. You know, because it's like, I didn't say that. Prove it. Well, <laughs> let's go to the tape. <laughs> I've, I've had a couple where I got with Bruce, and I say something, and it's like a goofy Chinese movie. My, my lips are going, and, and like some voice comes in. It's like Bruce, and he's like, oh, says the Lord. But that ain't what I said, right? I'm like, oh. He was copping some attitude or something like that. And he's like, praise the living God. Heaven is not my home. <laughs> or he'll do a burp, and he'll put like a thing in front of my face. and like, burp. He does, yeah. I don't know. You guys remember the videos from COVID? Yeah. They were wild, right? 
I mean, dude, a few mushrooms, and I was off and running, man. Like, oh, all those memes and stuff. Did I say that out loud? Okay. I like mushrooms and onions in my eggs. Where the heck are you going with that? Wow. 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 <laughs> man, a little projecting going on there, I think. But anyway, that's a recovery term. Oh. How you doing, Crusher? Am I keeping you up? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mario's already asleep. He's usually asleep in the first 30 seconds anyway, so it's all right. He, he watches the videos, I think. I don't know. Anyway, it's okay. He does so much around here. It's like, dude, take a nap. It's all good. Now, look what happens here. He shifts gears from us, and, and there's a bunch of stuff going on here because, remember, what we're going into now is the Babylonian captivity. Well, Babylon's going to come. And this is like the second time around. This is Nebuchadnezzar two, And, you know, this is where, you know, before they were, they were taken into captivity and there was battles, there was uh, deals made, all kinds of stuff. And then, you know, deals broken and stuff. And this time when they came in, they destroyed Jerusalem, man. They came and burned every stinking house down because they usually leave a remnant of people to farm and do the grapevines so that they can take them to Babylon, right? And so they, they have to be there because that's where the land's at. Well, this time, man, they just came and wiped everything out, man. They burned the temple down. They tore it down, destroyed it, took all the gold stuff, like the goblets and the bowls and stuff, and they, snapped, they stole all that and took it to Babylon. And, and Babylon is this massive city, man, with those you know, the 320-foot walls, 80-foot thick, right? And, and what it is is it's just a big, giant, round city with a, a palace, but the Euphrates River ran right through the stinking middle of it, man. And Nebuchadnezzar had built these canals they went all the way around Babylon and then connected back to the Euphrates and then it went. So it was almost impossible to get into Babylon as, a, as an army. And so they had all this water. They had these formidable walls. And, and the queen, um, I forgot her name, Nitocris, she was into building bridges, man. That was just a thing back then. It was a, you know, if you could build a bridge, you could conquer a nation, thing like that. But anyway, I'll get to that. But, but historically, look what he says here. He's talking about himself, who frustrates the signs of babblers and drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backwards and makes their knowledge foolish. Now, if you read enough about Nebuchadnezzar, you'll know that, that he used, he was constantly pulling people in as diviners, um, sorcerers, soothsayers, and all this other stuff. And, and that's ultimately, when we're getting tonight, I mean, his, you know, Daniel's going to be brought into this thing because he was thought of as a seer or a... a like a kind of like a, he could reveal dreams, right? And he was, you know, Daniel was captured to Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. This is all the time frame that was happening right there. But if you read enough about Nebuchadnezzar, do you know what happened to that dude? He ended up out like a wild, stinking animal, man, clawing on the ground, his fingernails, he's, you know, eating grass or whatever it was, total like a crazy man just roaming around out in the wilderness because he frustrates the signs of the babblers. He drives diviners mad, and he turns wise men backwards and make their, makes their knowledge foolish. There, there's so much happening right there that's going to happen that, that Isaiah was prophesying, and a long time before it happened, just so you know, and I'll get to that in a minute. When it all was happening, though, Israel, see, they would remember all this stuff from Isaiah. This, this was studied a lot. And then as it was happening, they'd be going, oh, hey, Crusher. Check that out, man. Didn't he say that dude was going to go nuts, man? And all these things that we've been talking about here, they would start happening for them. And we've got to pay attention because Isaiah was for this group of people 3,000 years ago and this group of people in 2022. Amen. The stuff that we're reading in Isaiah is transferring right through history and things are so when we're looking at stuff happening in Isaiah, you better start opening your eyes to see what the heck's going on, right? So check this out. He says, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers. This is the prophets, the word of his servant and perform the counsel of his messengers. It would be Isaiah and all the other prophets, Jeremiah, Amos, all of them. This would confirm who they, he said, he said, when you, when they talk, listen, because I'm speaking to their brain and they're speaking to you. And he says, who says to Jerusalem, this is what the prophet is saying, who says, Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, the cities of Jerusalem shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places. So this is all prophesied. So there's a question mark on this for these people. They're going, well, what the heck's going to happen? I mean, it sounds like 
<laughs> things are going to get messed up for us, man, if this is all real. Well, check this out. It did get messed up very quickly. And, and on this night, I'm going to tell you about this night that was really cool, man. But I'm going to read this part to you because I want you to understand now where history and the Bible click, like in a really cool way. Not just saying, I was there at the Declaration of Independence. I made a prophecy about a rolling glory three. This is way bigger than that. Look what it says here. Again, God speaking. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Now, the rivers were where it was at, okay? The Tigris and the Euphrates, if you had a navy, you could navigate up and down these rivers, and you could conquer people. You just roll right up to the shore, let all your guys off, they kill people, jump back on the boat, and down the road you go. You go up and take all their stuff, put it in your boat, take it back to your house. So rivers were the absolute key. But if you didn't have a navy, then you were stuck because you get to the river and you couldn't get across unless you tried to build a bridge or something like that. But the Euphrates is a massive river. And I'm going to tell you a story about what happened here in a minute in regard to the river. But, but let's look what it says here. Who says to the deep, be dry and I will drive your rivers. Who says to Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Cyrus is the king of Persia at this time. This is after the, the, the Medo-Persian War. So Darius was running around. We remember Darius from Esther, the book of Esther and all that stuff. Okay, well, Darius was running with Cyrus because Cyrus conquered him. So they, you know, assimilated him into their army and off they went. That's why when, when you see at the end of Daniel, it says that, that, that Belshazzar was killed and the city was taken by Darius the Great. It's all the same night, but Cyrus was the king, the Persian king. I know it's weird, but just hang in there with me for a second. Who says to Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. And you go to the book of Esther and you see what was going on with Darius, and you remember that Cyrus was the one that gave the command for Israel to be allowed to go back out of, out of Babylon. They were in Babylon, the, and, and Babylon was conquered. They were still there, and he allowed them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. But that night, the night I'm talking about right here, before this night, Cyrus was already pissed off at Nebuchadnezzar, or, or it was Belshazzar. Um, Belshazzar, um, he was a, a regent king. They called him King Belshazzar of Babylon, but he really wasn't. He was Nebuchadnezzar's son. But, but there was another dude named Nitocris or something like that. And his wife, or Nebo, Nebo something, or Nebo Christ or something like that. He was like the king, but he was never there in Babylon. So Belshazzar ran the place, and his mom was Nitocris. She was there, the queen of Babylon. She was into bridges, man. She dug, building bridges. So inside Babylon, the Euphrates River ran right across, right? So she built a bridge across that thing in a couple of places so people could just like party. They were party animals in Babylon. And they just jump across these little rip, these bridges and stuff like that. Well, somewhere along the line, one of, her, one of her friends from like the 90210, they couldn't get in. And so she's like, you know what? I'm going to build a bridge over the Euphrates so that my friends could come in. And, and it was designed so at night they could close it off so people couldn't get like over and stuff like that. So what she did was she went up a, a little a few miles north of Babylon and she took all the slaves and made them dig a big old basin. It was 47 miles basin, 47 square mile basin. And then they cut a trench and trenches and they diverted the Euphrates into this big basin, right? And then the water level dropped enough and she stacked her rock. Well, she didn't, but all her slaves stacked the rocks and she built her bridge and then they closed up the thing and the Euphrates rose back up and then it came to the, the, the walls of Babylon and you could not get in because the river ran to the very bottom of the walls that were 80 feet thick. If you tried to get an army under that thing, you drowned before you got to the other side. There was no way in, man. Anywhere around Babylon, there was a river flowing. So Cyrus was going to attack him, however he was thinking about doing it at the time. But he was crossing the Ginzi River, another river up to the north of him there. And he was looking for a place to walk across that was shallow enough to ford. And one of his really bad stallions, man, a big, beautiful stallion, probably had the same attitude as Cyrus, just jumped in the water and started going across. And he's like, yeah, it's a sign, man. My horse found a way. He got about halfway in, dunked under, and the river took him. Pew! And he drowned, man. Deader than fried chicken, or deader than a drowned horse. And it 
pissed him off so bad that he got all his guys, he put half of his army on the other side of the river and half of his army on this side and made him dig a bunch of trenches, man. He told the river, I'm going to defeat you. You'll be so low a woman could walk across and not get her knees wet. He was yelling at the river. Spent a whole summer doing that. Cut all these trenches and the river freaking dropped, man. And you could literally walk right across the Ganyas River and all this water flooded out. And then the, you know, the stories go that he made a deal with a bunch of farmers you know, because he was going to take over and he wanted them to all be on his side. So he made a bunch of waterways for him. I, I like the first story better myself. But anyway, he got up to Babylon, man, and either him or one of his guys goes, Oi, you remember that basin that that queen Nicodemus or whatever did? You know what? If we just like pop some channels, I'll bet we could drop the level of the river. And you know what they did? They went and popped some channels in there, and the Euphrates went right in there. It dropped so low that it only came up to the thighs of the men. And they were able to go right into the river, go right around the side, and tunnel right sticking under the wall to get into Babylon. Now, that night they were doing that, Belshazzar was throwing a party because he was like, he, he was like Herod the Great, you know, was a regent. He wasn't a real king. The Romans put him in there. Well, Herod, the second Herod, he was like this young dip that Jesus had to deal with. He's like a party animal, you know, and like to party, right? Well, that was Belsh Belshazzar. So Belshazzar was in there partying, and he brought out all the golden goblets of the temple and all their bowls and stuff, and he was pouring wine and stuff in there, and he was giving them to all his wives and concubines and the prostitutes, and everyone was just having this big party. They were all drunk and having a great time, and all of a sudden this hand, this human hand, pops up on the wall and writes, meeny, meeny, Tico Perez on the wall. And they're like, dude, there's a hand writing on the wall. And the queen's like, oh, my God, I, heard, I remember this dude, this dude uh, Daniel. Let's, let's find out what this is. And he came in and told him, wow, man, you've been measured and weighed, and you suck. You come up wanton, dude. And that night, Cyrus's army, Darius, went under the walls of Babylon. Everyone was, woo -hoo -hoo, partying. And all of a sudden, they're like, wow, look, there's some new dudes at the party. And they got swords. What the heck is going on here? And you know what? They took Babylon without a fight because everyone was drunk, man, and just partying and stuff. And that's how Cyrus took Babylon because he lowered the level. He dried up the Euphrates. Let me go back. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers? Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd? I'm going to drop the river and I'm going to send my shepherd in to gather my sheep in Babylon and he shall perform all my pleasure saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Cyrus brought them all, sent them all back to Jerusalem. Just like it said right there. Here's the deal. This happened 200 years before Cyrus was ever born. He wasn't even around yet, man. And he named him by name and he called the Euphrates being dried. That really happened, man. That was historical. This isn't biblical knowledge I'm telling you about. This is historical research that I did. I know this happened through several different authors and stories of what happened, how Cyrus took Babylon. And that's how he did it. Whether you're just going to do the worldly research, knock yourselves out. But I'm going to tell you this with that worldly research lined right up with 27 and 28 here in Isaiah 44, man. I get excited about this. I know. Okay. But look what Ezra says. Let me show you something over in Ezra. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Uh oh. I, I totally was like not marking these, man. I totally should have marked my Bible, but now I got to do it the hard way. This is my new Bible, so it doesn't have those cool little tabby things on it. So I got to like go book by book. Does anybody know the, the books by heart? Kids do. Yeah, I probably taught them to our youth. I just wasn't paying attention myself. Okay, what was I looking for? Are you sure? I don't think my Bible has Ezra. Huh? Before Psalms? Okay, I suck right now. Look at me, man. I'm like, oh, the pastor can't find a dang book. It's actually between Genesis and Revelation. I just found it. Okay. Ezra 4. And if you want to write a historical note down, you write down your little thing. Um, Daniel 5, chapter 5. The whole chapter that talks about this night that I'm talking about right now. This is the that's the night that all this happened. It's in Daniel five. You can find it in other places. You can find it in Jeremiah. And, yeah, but right here in, in Ezra, this is also a record of what happened with Jerusalem. So I wanted to share it with you before we cut out of here. It goes like this: Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, 
that the word of the Lord by mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of, of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, there's your history right there, by the way. He put it in writing himself. So now we have a written record of this. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among, who is among all of you? His, oh, I'm only going to three, right? Or four, okay. Well, anyway, who is among you of all his people? May God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. Okay, so this is, this is Cyrus writing down a proclamation that God put it on his heart to go to Jerusalem and rebuild it. And then over here, 200 years earlier, Isaiah said, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. Well, he said, who says Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He shall perform all my pleasure. Saying, Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Isn't that freaking amazing? To me, it's insanely cool, man, because Cyrus was not a godly person, man. I mean, he had, this, he had an encounter with God. There's no doubt about that. Darius wasn't a godly person. These aren't godly people. But God used these ungodly people to perform the tasks that he needed to perform. He even used Nebuchadnezzar, man, the most ungodly of them all in order to, judge, to, pat, to bring judgment on Israel so they could stop stinking sinning, man, and worshiping idols because they, they were now put in the pressure cooker. And when he released them, they were so grateful that he kept this word that they went on to follow him for many, 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 many years. And then some other kings came and screwed it all up. But anyway, for a long time, they did really good and they built the temple. So here's our get it question tonight. What if God is using the ungodly to rebuild America? Just saying, just asking, you know. We certainly have a, a group of people in, in American politics that do a whole lot of claiming to be God, but sure are leaning in way far directions from him. Amen? Darius, or, or Cyrus right here, just said, oh, the, the Lord God of Israel told me to do all this stuff, and, and he did, but, you know, that don't, that don't make him a believer on God. That makes him someone that knows, or at least speaks of him, so I wonder sometimes, are some of the things that are going on in our nation, because I'm here to tell you right now, man, I'm not going to get all political on you, but some of the crap that's going on in our country right now is freaking disgusting to me, man. I am people live and let live, man, whoever, you bugger who you're going to want, all right? You take that up with God, all right? But pushing this stuff on our children is disgusting and infuriating to me, to be honest with you. Our nation looks like Sodom and Gomorrah right now. You guys know what happened to those two places, by the way? They turned into the big hole that smoked in the dark. Gone? Well, what if God, and I've been saying this for years, man, that I, I believe that as Christians, believers in America, we've really slacked, man, on our prayers for our country. We get kind of wrapped up in our own stuff, you know, and we just haven't taken time to talk to God about our nation, man. And I wonder sometimes if we're, doing a little Babylon thing right now, man. And God's shaking the tree a little bit because I think a lot more Christians now, today, are getting their eyes wide open, man. They're looking around going, what the heck is going on around here, man? Who are all these wingnuts and when did we put them in leadership spots? I don't know. That's just, maybe that's just my own opinion, but hey, what I do know about this, though, is God loves this country, man. This country was founded and built on him, and we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for the hand of God on this nation right now, man. And I believe that with all my heart. That I believe in those flags, and I believe in God, man, and I believe in guns. <laughs> that was a little redneck right there, right? I mean, uh, sorry. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just jumped in my big Chevy truck, <laughs> opened a beer. <laughs> Forgot what I was doing here for a second. God, guns, and guts made America free at all costs. Keep all three, right? Remember the t-shirts? Why does this story, what does this story show us about the reality of dad's power? Okay, first of all, he is all powerful. Can we agree? Can I get an amen on that? He is all powerful. There's nobody in this room more powerful than God. Never will be. Not smarter, not wiser, not bigger, not badder, not gooder, not nothing. God is the tippy top of the tippy top. Amen? All power. In all power, he can create all good in our lives, and he can create all bad in our lives. 
in, in like somewhere um, Leviticus maybe, there's a great verse that says, today I give you blessings and curses, life and death. Choose life, God says. He goes, it's on, here it is. You can have, there they are, life, death, blessing, curses. Which one do you want? I think I'll take a little paint check curse, <laughs> a little paprika on my hard-boiled eggs, and bow, and you get hand like, eh, there's a big angel with a big button. Eh, wrong answer, stupid. Okay, I'll take the blessing over here. It, it, we're so, aren't we, what's wrong with us? <laughs> I mean, Wow. But I, I digress. I come back as pastor now. <laughs> it's impossible. I can't get back. Anyway, he's telling us here through all this, look, you guys, I'm laying it out in front of you, man. Isn't it crazy that, oh, yeah, look at it look like this, man. There's, there's two buckets of water, and one has salamanders and, like, green stuff floating on it, and one's, like, you know, sparkling, like, you know, arrowhead water or something like that. And he's like, here I put these buckets for you. Behold, take a drink of the one that you choose. And why the heck would we dip a bucket full of salamanders and slime and take a big drink of that? But we do. Isn't it bizarre? It's the stinking, crazy, sinful nature of human nature. Like, wow, it looks kind of crappy, but maybe there's something good down there that I can't see. I think, whoop, and down we go. And you have a little whoop, whoop down there with the salamanders. <laughs> oh, whatever the heck that's going to be about. That's all between you and God. You work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But anyway, eventually you're going to pop out and you're going to go, those salamanders ain't cool, man. Yeah, they oh, just kind of creepy with the fingers that stick to you and all that. Duh. I just want out of there. And he's like, come on. He pulls you out. It says in Psalms, out of the muck and mire, whoop, whoop, and he does you off and boop, throws you in the nice bucket there and you're all good. I don't know. I'm sorry. We're ranting. Here, let's look at the application. Is anybody still with me yeah. <laughs> at this point? Because I'm not, so I'm hoping you guys are a little bit plugged into what the heck's happening tonight. This is the application. The Bible is written to be excavated. excavated. Can you dig it? Get it? Huh? I wasn't even, even, even going to rip off Joe Dirt. I wasn't going to do it, man. Life's a garden. Okay. I came up with my own. And I don't even have a mullet, all right? The Bible was written to be excavated. Because, you know, I tell you guys to fall in love with the Word of God all the time. Let me tell you another thing. Excavate the Bible. Start digging right here. And you're going to find this thing right here. It's going to say Nehemiah 3.14. It's called a reference. It's an excavate. You just found a nugget of something. Then you know what you do? You go like this over to Nehemiah, and you read it, and you're like, oh, wow, that's a head freeze, man. And then he goes, yeah, check this out. Go over to Psalm 101, verse 4. Okay, and you know what you're doing? You know when they dig out dinosaurs, man, and they do little brushes and stuff like that, and, they, and there's like eyeballs and teeth and all that stuff, and they're going, that's what you're doing here. And then eventually they step back, and there's this beautiful T-Rex skeleton laying there, man. They're like, wow, cowabunga, it's a T-Rex, man. But well, we look at this thing and go, cowabunga, that just totally made sense to me, man. That just rocked my world right there. A, excavate the Bible, amen? Can you dig it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. It is so much fun, Lord, in, your, in this book of Isaiah. We're just really digging it, I think, I'm sure. You know, it's, it's just good stuff here, Father, for all of us. So tonight we ask that your Holy Spirit move that in us, that we can just take it in and digest a little bit and just chew on that stuff, Father, and see what comes out of it for us, Lord. But our desire that anybody that's in this room right now <clears throat> that doesn't know your son, Jesus, this is truly what all this is about right now, Lord. Just a desire to for them to have the same joy and happiness and power and victory that we have, Lord. And so tonight we ask your Holy Spirit to just touch them right now. Wherever they're sitting right now, Lord, just ping, just ping them with it right now, Lord. And those that are out there in TV land, ping, let them have one too, Lord. And just say, tonight's your night. This is your blessed night. It ain't even a lucky night. This is your blessed night, man. This is your night of salvation and redemption and victory and stepping away from the dark side forever. So, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit move across this room right now, Father, and just have your way in Jesus' name. Let's all pray together. Father God, I sin against you, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. He's almighty, almighty, amen.
Look, if you, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or you've rededicated your life, on that Elkit card, you'll see a little thing down there on the bottom somewhere that says that. Put your name on it and mark that and you put it in that little bucket over there by Cookie Man. And if you don't have a Bible, who, you, talk, talk to somebody, Amy or something. We'll get you a Bible, man. We, get, we got Bibles for you and stuff like that. Because we want you to get a good foundation when you cut out of here, man, if that's what's going on for you. Because it's a blessing, man. If you, if you gave your life to Christ, you rededicated your life, man. You just, stepped, you, just, you just built your house on a rock, man. God's in control of that rock. <laughs> Don't forget that. You make your rock bounce, and it might roll. And then you know what that means, right? Rock and roll. <laughs> I got to stop. Boop. Okay, actually, I'm doing pretty good tonight. Wow, trick it out. Yeah, but a good roll. So we'll have girls praying over here, guys praying over here. If you need a Bible, come and see us. If you gave your life to Christ, come and see us. Hi, Scotty. I see you over there. And beyond that, hi, mister, back there. I see you. Did you, get, did you give your life to Christ? Are you saved? Good for you, buddy. Yes! Got one over here, too. Hallelujah, man. This is good stuff. Hallelujah. Let's get, get these guys. We'll get these guys the Bible. We'll get something really cool for you back there. By the way, I dig your courage to wear that shirt. You are saying, I am who I am, and that's all there is to it. All right, that's what it's all about, being a biker, mister. Hey, you know what, you guys? Keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless you guys. Come and get your Bibles.